It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. It's Torah Talk. What is my name? What is my summer's name? It's Torah Talk. We are witnesses and watchmen of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <coughs> it's the Torah Zone! Here we go. How are you, brothers? Sister, hey, how are you fun. going? Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Just great. I. Uh, you, you, are you going to be gone in two weeks? No, no. We're um, we're still waiting for the salon to sell. Oh, um, okay. So we'll just have the caravan in our garage. It's like one of those wind-up things. So it's sort of very low. So it's streamlined and then you wind it up. It's like a cross between a caravan and a tent. <laughs> so it's, they call it oh. like a, a camp trailer type thing. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So you, you, it's a trailer then? Yeah, it's a trailer. Oh. And then you add your annexes and things around it to make, you know, so the family can spread out a bit more. Right. So, yeah. But it just happens, yeah. Um, what are you going to be pulling it in? Uh, well, when the salon sells, we'll ha we'll just get it like a people mover, like a van or something like that. Uh, it's not really heavy, so we don't need a four-wheel drive, and we don't really want to go off-road to those real remote places anyway with a big family. So we'll just stick to the main, you know, d dirt roads and <laughs> you know things like that. The main but, dirt roads. <laughs> the main dirt roads. <laughs> We're not really going too off-road. So. Well, I'll get it anyway. I thought Amy was going to be here, so I love you. Tell, give Amy my love. I will. I will. We'll, we'll tee up something during the week, sister. We'll get together. All right. Okay. Mm, bye bye. Oh yeah. Okay. How are you, mate? Well, I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Well, this is uh, 
going to be an interesting topic today. <laughs> yeah, we'll I got, I got Todd's uh, Yahoo. Oh, and, uh, thirteen. See, I've got Kazam. You must have it in both. Yeah, you must have it in both. Yeah. This is the one I had that was handy. Yeah. So uh, he's got one page, basically, of a statement of belief. And, of course, uh, this is uh, widely acceptable for all of us. But, uh, you know, he's listed things here, you know. Mm. Uh, you know oh, there's a fly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, something about making a list of your faith. Uh, a lot of times it's motivated by the fact that there's so many diverse beliefs, you know. Mm. And I, yeah. I'm thinking that, well, the evidence in Scripture that we if we were to go to Scripture and say, well, where is the statement of faith at, you know, from Scripture? Uh, it's always been a very simple thing. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, Do the commandments, wouldn't it? Well, one of the things that uh, in Second Timothy and 4.2, chapter 4, uh, it's preach the word. You know, and the, a lot of Christians don't know what the word actually is. But when Yahuwah is talking about obey my word, he's talking about his covenant. And when we read the, the Ten Commandments, that's the heart of his mind. And it's uh, love, you know, how to love me and how to love your neighbor. That's what the Ten Commandments teach. And so, you know, it's our, our speech and our actions. So I've got speak and act here to kind of prompt. And this is really the central feature of our report, or, you know, it's love for one another. That would be the central feature. Now, if it isn't there, then our doctrine and our list of beliefs is wrong. Mm -hmm. Or at least it's not alive, it's dead, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, when you look at the word statement of belief or statement of faith, you have to analyze those words. A statement is something that you speak or it's something that you show and and that's interesting too because it's uh it's mentioned in another place um in a letter we're the letter actually our bodies and our lives and our speech and our and our manners the way we live and our customs that is a letter that is read by those around us whether it's uh, other family members or um uh, other people in the world you know so when they look at us, they're not thinking, oh, yeah, those people are definitely vampires. Or they're Satanists because they're obeying the commandments of Yahuwah. Or they're using the name Yahuwah. We don't know who Yahuwah is, so those people must be automatically uh, outside the boundaries or off the rails. But it's a matter of people that don't know the truth that we're sent to. And um, anyway, in Second Corinthians 3, it talks about our obedience and the letter that's written, but not with ink. So, and then, of course, we have to look at the word belief. A statement of faith or a statement of belief. Well, the Hebrew word, don't you love these flash cards? Oh, yeah. The word imuna, which can be translated in the idea of faithfulness. Uh, not so much just thought, but thoughts and actions together, you know. Mm -hmm. Because just thinking something in the Greek mindset is just thinking. But in the Hebrew mindset, it's not just thinking something, but it's showing your belief by what you do. That's what the, the book of James is talking about, Yaakov. Uh, faithfulness, fidelity. That's where you get the word fa, fidelity. Semper fa is Latin for always faithful. You've heard that, probably. <laughs> fa, dude. Yeah. Anyway, amuna is the Hebrew word. And a man will live by his amuna. You know, and that's living by your amuna means that you're practicing something, not just believing something in your head. Like, I believe that the uh, speed of light is 282,000 miles, or two, what, what is it? Uh, 186,000 miles per second. Okay. I'll take I your believe, word for it. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's 186, 282, I think, miles per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second. I believe that. You know, but I really haven't ever tested it or proven it. But if I uh, 
put my faith and trust in certain things that I believe, and I practice it, then the world sees that I actually do believe something. You know, yeah. uh, that's a bad example, but you know. What I mean. Yeah, yeah. You you know you slow down when you go around a curve because you know that if you don't, you might just you know centrifugal force will keep you going. Mm -hmm. You know you have to believe in the law of gravity. You know, mm -hmm. you know. Then jump off a building. <laughs> That's right. Even if you are wearing a Batman costume, yeah, or a yeah. Superman costume, yeah. But anyway, it, mm. it's uh, interesting that Yahusha even addressed this too, when he was talking about good fruit and bad fruit, and saying, "Well, you know, here's the evidence. Look at the fruit. You know, uh, the justification of wisdom is her children." But uh, in Matthew, in Matthew 12, particularly verse 37. He says, by your words, you will be declared righteous. Mm -hmm. And by your words, you will be declared unrighteous. So um, just declaring what we believe is not exactly enough. Mm -hmm. But we can go through what we believe. Mm -hmm. And then others that don't believe the same way will have a way of saying, well, they're wrong about that. These are doctrinal strongholds that most of us find ourselves in. I mean, we might have some too. and we, But we test everything according to the word first. But um, Did you say um, justification of wisdom is children? What does that mean? Wisdom is justified by her children. Oh, now, that's, that's what Yahushua said. Okay. Yeah, he was being accused of uh, hanging around with Ill, uh, Ill, people of ill repute. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, wisdom is justified by her children. Mm -hmm. Of course, people can look that up and uh, find out what, where that is, but I forgot where it was. We could find it real easy. But the, uh, the fact is he did say that, and it's, your, it's part of the fruit, you know, yeah. if you're... Uh, Show up on Being, your uh, yeah, yeah. You can be judged by human extern external things, uh, and, and that's not a righteous judgment, obviously. You know, just because a person's working in a prison doesn't mean that because they're around prisoners, and maybe they themselves are a prisoner, guilty of having committed a crime, uh, that doesn't mean that everything that they say is wrong or evil. It it, it means that. Because their words, if they're if they're of Yahuwah, then they are to be heard, you know. But um, yeah. speaking the word is what we're supposed to do. But the fruit, of course, is the fruit of the spirit from having internalized the, the words of the covenant uh, yields the fruit, which is the fruit of the spirit which is the life that's in the person that has that. And that would be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control. And those are the fruits that a person exhibits. Of course, that's from practicing the, the commandments. And you get better with practice, and you get stronger by exercising, you know, those commandments. So as the uh, years pass, you will become stronger, and stronger, and you'll sin less, never ever having, you always have wrestling with that, but you get better at it, you know. Hmm. Oh, last night I had a dream, and in the dream, I found myself at work, I don't know what, where I was exactly, it was some job, and then I realized after I had done, or had been there for some time, that it was the Sabbath, hmm. and I just felt terrible, I said, oh no. What have I done? But you see, it's like you don't forget what day it is. Not not really. Because you keep practicing, you know. But uh, a worldly person might not express their belief often every day, and they're not living for Yahuwah, but they're living for themselves. And they might forget and go, oh, I forgot. I can't eat ham. That's something that's an abomination. That's, you know. That's not something that I do because you don't practice it enough, maybe, you know. So you need to constantly, every day, look at the and analyze everything, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you but, think uh, 
Yeah, do you think do you think the time from the last few sessions we've had, the time is coming very quickly, isn't it? Uh, we were talking the other day, I was talking to Chris about and he was saying, Have you heard what's happening in the UN Mark? I said, No. You know, I don't watch the you know, the broadcast T V much and uh he said, Oh, there's people get leaving, the guy at the top's left and something else has happened and this has happened and he was explaining I didn't understand what he was saying at first. He was saying, Well what happens if America falls? He said, where's the beast? And I said, well, because everyone thinks the beast is in Rome, but I'm thinking from our last few sessions, you've been saying, well, the beast would probably be the UN, wouldn't it? The, you know, the, you know, and if that falls, that really, that's kind of like the end, isn't it? It's going to start happening. Uh -huh. yeah. Where do you think we're at with all that? Yeah, that's, uh, the United States is, uh, when they embraced the United Nations, to allow it to come in. So we can see back decades and decades ago, the League of Nations was the attempt to rule the world. It was a global government that was starting to get things lined up and the United States wouldn't join. And so it collapsed. So the, the next phase of the plan was to create the Council on Foreign Relations and then to, and their first act was to create the United Nations and they put it in the, they cozied up to the port city of, the, of New York and uh, that way they could introduce themselves slowly and make, uh, make themselves feel familiar. And I thought that it was really interesting because of the physical features of the UN building, I think by Rockefeller, or financed by him in part. And then the, uh, the fact that the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey had this huge obelisk, they called it, but it was exactly, it looked exactly like the design of the United Nations building, you know, and the stars that are inside, you know, they looked inside of it and the guy says, it's full of stars. Well, I think that was a significant statement because stars are a reference to the fallen messengers, you know, and the fallen messengers obviously are working closely with the things that are going on inside the United Nations. Mm. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, I made a note of as I was kind of meditating on this topic was that uh, what we have is a warning towards the very end of Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, is the Torah of Moshe which is the covenant, you know, the, at Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. There's, and it, people have been ignoring it. They took it out of the schools here in the United States. When my wife was going through public school, I didn't go to public school. I went to a private, you know, Catholic Jesuit thing. You know. But Phyllis was attending a public school. When she was a child, they had the Ten Commandments in every classroom. But sometime during the 60s, they removed those. But, uh, I thought that Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 5 through 10 were relevant to this topic because let's look at that real quick and see Romans. That would be right there. Chapter 10, verse 5. Now watch this. For Moshe writes about the righteousness, which is of the Torah. The man who does these shall live by them. But the righteousness of belief speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who shall ascend into the heavens? That is, to bring Messiah down. Or who shall descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of belief which we are proclaiming that if you confess with your mouth the Master Yahushua and believe in your heart that Elohim has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. And that's uh, a statement of belief. You know, that's what we're talking about here. And I found that statement of belief right there in Romans chapter 10. That's it. It's not really complicated. You know, it doesn't mention the virgin birth or, of course, I'm, you know, 
convinced that that's a fact, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say that that's required. But you know, we uh, at no scripture. The more scripture you study, the more details that emerge, and we're you know surrounded by miracles all the time, every day. We recognize them. Even unbelievers know that things are miraculously happening. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, they just, they would like to deny it, of course. But uh, So how would you like to begin with this? You want to mention a few of these? Yeah, just go for it. You're, the, the ones in Todd's book tend to be very focused on Yahushua, don't they? And the ones on your site are Yahushua plus a few other topics as well, aren't they? Yes, yes. So, yeah, just go there. Well, I believe Rabbi Yahushua, Anatsri, is the Yehudi Mashiach, and that he is deliverance. He's our, our deliverance. And he's the seed of King Dat Daud, born of the Virgin Miriam, was without sin, without guile, without deceit. And he's obedient to his father, Ab. And he was immersed by Yehudkinen and anointed by the Ruach HaKodesh. And he is the high priest, or the Kohen, like Melchizedek. And he is our Kohen, Kohen Hakado, our, our high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And he is a Nabi, or a prophet, like unto Moshe. And he is sovereign, like Daud, or Melech. And he's made manifest into flesh and blood to destroy the works of Hashatan. And that's all scripture. He is our suffering servant who suffered for us and was <clears throat> an offering for sin. He was pierced in his hands and feet and side. He shed his blood for us, and his blood cleanses us from all sins. He was executed upon the execution stake for us. He died for us, was buried for us, and was raised from the dead the third day for us. He is alive forevermore, the first fruits, and he's he saw no corruption. He's now ascended into Shamayim, and he is the fulfillment of over three hundred prophecies from the Tanakh. That's what the Christians call the Old Testament. He's the fulfillment of the Moedim, the uh, appointed times. The Christians probably don't know much about. He is the fulfillment of all things, including the Habrit HaKadashah, or the Renewed Covenant. He's the promised Mashiach and sovereign of Israel. He is our Yom Kippur. He is our Pesach Lamb, our substitutionary sacrifice and propitiatory offer offering. He came the first time as a suffering servant and is coming back the second time as our triumphant sovereign. Oh boy, it can happen any time. Uh, now Yahusha and his Ab are a cod. That means one. So you're saying one and the same. Mm. There is no distinction. <laughs> but that's going to be a problem for people mm. right now. Yeah. That's going to be a problem for people. Yahusha is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, of the land. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much more that could be added that we believe, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah. these are essentials. You know, the very first thing that you have to believe, though, is that when you look around at the world and you say, well, what do I see? You know, is seeing believing? Well, yeah. There's a there's a created a, there's a creation. How did it get here? Did it create itself? Well, here's the thing. Uh, what if the scriptures actually are true? Well, those of us that believe that they are also believe that they were written by some forty people over many hundreds of years, and they all say the same thing. They're consistent that, you know, obey these, this covenant, and if you don't obey it, then you're going to be 
you know, cursed. Here's the curses. And Israel is, is, has been for our example all through time. And it's just amazing that Yahuwah is, is so consistent. So we know that the, because the prophecies all fulfilled were fulfilled, that he knew they were going what they were gonna do, and how it was gonna happen, and what they needed to do to repent, and that when they would, when they would repent, that he would heal their land, and you know. Well, the thing of it is, they the scriptures are actually inspired, and so if you believe that foundational truth, then you can move forward by studying that word. And then you'll find yourself in the right place. Because when I came to study science, I saw a lot of inconsistencies. People wouldn't agree on the outcomes and the theories. And, uh, and it was just all a giant guess. And each individual had a slightly different feeling about things. Everybody was doing what was right in their own mind. and That's what scripture talks about too. We're not supposed to be like that. Everybody's supposed to be united in their mind on it, on each topic. Mm -hmm. So the more unity that we have, you know, the better off we get along with one another, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if we can all agree that the word is inspired, then we have a really important first step that we've taken. But uh, if you don't believe it, like I was saying that some people that I've been in, around believe that Constantine wrote the scriptures. Wow. <laughs> he, just made a, he just made a few a few copies. He ordered them yeah. to be made. Actually, he didn't write them, but he had somebody commissioned to do that, to make copies of certain books, you know. But, uh, you know, he didn't write them, though, you know. <laughs> you know? But, but that's been told to people. Like, like, my dad was told that when he was in school. And Apparently, what he picked up was that Constantine wrote it. You know, it doesn't matter. You know. Uh, so anyway, I uh, I had to ask my dad uh, that how is it that they found these same books and the words are word for word and they were found from the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Dead Sea Scrolls and they were written two to three hundred or more years before Constantine was born. How did he manage it? You know. <laughs> so and he, he the scrolls are found all over, you know, not just in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, there's been mm -hmm. other scrolls, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, these these are strongholds that people get, you know, in their heart. Mm -hmm. But uh, so as far as um narrowing down what is permitted and what is not permitted by Torah if you start at the very beginning you would probably look for things that are probably mention the word everlasting in them possibly because when you start talking about oh that was just customary or that was you know we don't have to do that a lot of people would probably throw zitzit into that category too and yet and yet that is something that's an everlasting sign isn't it too like the, the Sabbath the the all these things that we're supposed to do, you know, don't cut your flesh, don't, you know, like tattoos and things, don't, you know, all these things. How would you sum up? Because for a younger generation, they'll look at it and go, well, that's just not relevant to, for today. What what do we, do we get stoned if, if we don't do it right? Or like, it's just not relevant. It's not written or, you know, they don't see it as being relevant to them um, because there's so many things that, that we are allowed to do and not allowed to do, and there's varying degrees of opinions on everything. How would you simply state what is permitted and what is not permitted when you're going through the Torah? Would you look for the words "this is everlasting" or how do you know what's customary? I mean, unless you're a scholar, how do you know what's customary and what is something that should still, no matter how set apart it makes us, is still for today? Okay, uh, I'd say that what we're looking at is more of a fleshly, out, out, outward, superficial appearance when we're talking about things like tzitzit or wearing uh, little hats or all these are superficial. Yeah, they're they're super, superficialities. They're manifestations that are not in uh, necessarily in the Torah for each other to look at and see one another doing. 
And that's, I think, what Yahusha's problem was when he said that you guys are lengthening your seat seats for show. You know, you're doing it for other people when the reason that you're wearing the seat seat, if it's from the heart, is because the Torah is something that you want. Because the, the, the Torah teaches us to wear seat seats, but it's for a particular reason. It's for us to remember the Torah. And it's a reminder. It's like tying a ribbon around your finger to remember something. Like, oh, I've got my child in the back seat. I better tie a ring around my finger so I don't leave my child in my car and let them bake. You know. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a problem remembering things. But, of course, if you're constantly reciting the commandments then uh, in your head, you know, as he said to do, you know, when you're walking along the road and when you're coming in and going out and all that. That's all part of the practicing of this of this covenant. But, um, you know, the words that he's talking about are listed in Deuteronomy chapter 5. That's what he wants us to talk about and think about, you know. Meditate in his word, you know, in the night, in the night, in the, in the day, in the morning, and in the evening. And uh, talk to each other about it, you know. So that's what we're doing. And we're confessing with our mouth these beliefs. And it makes the difference for us to to walk and stay in his will, you know. Because if we're in his will, whether you're wearing seat seat at the moment or not, that that's not the point. The point is the Torah, the obedience of the Torah. Um, let's see. There was something that I read. I was actually working on that seminar, and I believe it was had to do with uh, what is what really matters is the obeying the Torah, you know. Um, that's what matters. Whether you're a slave or whether you're free or whether you're rich or poor or whatever your race is or whatever your job is or whether you're a man or a woman, these are irrelevant. But what does matter is obeying the Torah. That's what matters. Uh, and obeying the Torah we can't look at somebody and say, well, I don't see any seat seats. Well, maybe they're wearing seat seats, but it's not visible. Maybe they've got them all. You know, I've got some that a sister just sent to me. Speaking of those. And these are mentioned in, I think, Numbers 15. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, there's four of them. Wow, and you can attach them any way you want. And these are all blue. I like the solid blue. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Over here, we just got a, a piece of elastic and uh, tied up in a circle, and then you just put it around you, and then you can wear it out or under your clothes, whatever you want. I think some of the ladies uh, clipped them onto their bra straps as well. I think that was really? a clever way to yeah. do it. Because if you're working professionally, sometimes you can't have them flying around. Sure. That was yeah. another idea. So. so it's not really for the unbelievers to say what the Torah is and what it isn't, is it? Because it's the Torah is supposed to be, if, if a spirit, if somebody with Yahushua spirit in them reads through the Torah, particularly the first five books of Moshe, and reads it, I think the spirit within you will in, uh, will let you know, well, there's no way you could possibly do that in today's world. That would be breaking the law. You can't go and throw a rock at somebody. You know, you'd go to jail. So instinctively, you common sense and the spirit within you, you, you can know that's because it, it's like you said it's an inspired document um so that would probably be the way to approach it wouldn't it you can't expect people without you inside them to be able to read it and understand a clue that's correct you know and one of the foundational ideas though of our willingness to obey it does it's a miracle that we even want to obey but because our flesh would never ever submit to the covenant nor even pay any attention to Yahusha. But he drew us with love, and he's waited for us, each one of us, and he's waiting for others to just turn to him and say, I, I don't want to run this show anymore. Let Why don't you do this? And he'll come in to the person and allow, if you allow him to, to take over your vessel, then everything becomes not only ease and light, because a yoke is is a body of instructions. That's what a yoke is. It's um, my my yoke is easy. 
and light. Uh, and he's humble, not meaning that he's not powerful, but he's very humble. And if you will allow him, he won't force himself on you. He'll let you perish, step over his, you know, his salvation. So you can, he can, you have to literally climb over him to get into the lake of fire. He's there. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he makes it very, very easy to obey him, his commandments. Because he's, his mind comes into you. And he uh, enables you to love the commandments. Because he actually writes the love for his commandments upon your heart and your mind. And you, and you go, wow, why was I resisting these? These are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but they're pleasing to the one that died for you and lives now inside you and, and created you. you know? So it would be uh, idiotic. It, it's just like, well, at first, it's, some things sound like foolishness. And then the next phase is they, they seem like it's common knowledge. You know? And then uh, people wind up agreeing with it. You know? and, but now we're out here pleading with people, or it's really not us pleading, though. It's, it says in the scripture that it's as if Yahushua is in us pleading and begging for people to listen to his, his ways, his covenant. And uh, so we're speaking the word, you know, when we list the Ten Commandments, you know. That's the statement of our belief. Our ultimate statement of our belief would be reading the Ten Commandments. And, of course, that's what I like to do at the seminars. Mm -hmm. you know, since this subject is dealing with that, do you want to read the Ten Commandments? Sure. So that would be the statement of our belief. Uh, let's see. Uh, I wonder if my computer has the Ten Commandments on it. Uh-oh. Yeah. PowerPoint documents. Let's see. Let's go to my... Uh, I'm going to open this one up here. Now. Because the Ten Commandments, are, Ten Commandments are dealing with ten specific yet broad instructions. But... Um, you would also include, like, say, if they were in Deuteronomy, you'd include, you'd, you'd read the whole thing, wouldn't you? You'd read and you'd find out about the flesh. Don't do this to your flesh. Don't, you know, don't draw all the stuff all over you. Don't eat certain foods because uh, they're not food. And don't, so you take in the whole instruction, don't you? Right. Yeah, the, the Torah is the five books of Moshe, but the heart of the Torah is the, the Ten Commandments. And of course, there's other places where there's you're to love your neighbor as yourself, and you're to not put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. You're not to curse the person who's deaf because they can't understand you. You're, you're, there's a lot of things that you're not supposed to do because it's unkind. You know, it's not the heart of Yahuwah. Anyway, here's the retelling of the covenant for the scattered tribes of Israel, and it's for the last days, and it's given in Deuteronomy five. Starting at verse 6, it says, Number 1, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number 2, you do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous Al, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. And in another place he said this, love me and keep my commandments, you know. <laughs> Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now, people might not understand the way that that's phrased, but the literal word that's in here for cast is nasa, which is the Hebrew word for throw. And the name of Yahuwah is very obvious. It says it right there, name of Yahuwah, your Elohim. And then the word ruin is the word shoah which it means to lay waste. So if you lay waste his name, it uh, doesn't just mean you're misusing it in the way that Christians might say, well, you said the word G-O-D. Well, G-O-D isn't his name. It's, it never will be. 
And uh, anyway, and the Lord is not his name either. That's a, a translation from B A A L in Hebrew. Now, the fourth commandment is guard the Sabbath day. Now, that's the Sabbath day. To set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commands you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall employ and, and you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And it's a sign of the everlasting covenant, like you were saying, everlasting. And it, you can find that in Ezekiel 20. Now, uh, the word male servant and female servant, that would apply to today's world as an employee, you know, someone that you employ. And, it, and it's clear that the Sabbath is a real day of the week and that there's actually a, some laws that are instructions that pertain to it. Like in Acts 1, verse 12, it says, Then they went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So that that would be a distance that you could travel. You wouldn't want to go long distances on the Sabbath, you know. And it hasn't anything to do with uh, wh where the telephone poles are, or you know, like the rabbinical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, number five in the in the Ten Commandments is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged. And so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number ten, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now, in those commandments, instructions, or Torah, are all the word that we're supposed to be looking at. And that would include, of course, uh, the idea of how to love Yahuwah and how to love your neighbor. And if you do these things, they'll, you'll live inside them and you'll say, well, I see them now. I understand them. They're all wonderful. And uh, there's no reason to hate them. But that is the statement of our belief more than anything else. You know, I would hope. And if it's not, <laughs> well, we've got a long way to go to find them. But he said that these are not hidden. They're not up in heaven. They're not like across the sea. They're right here. They're here for you to obey them. So why not study them? You know, when I'm driving, sometimes I've I've mentioned before, I'll recite them in my head. You know, just number one, number two, and you know, it's a wonderful thing. So, um, pertaining to um, hellfire, heaven and hell, where um, they're kind of like maxims. Would you say they're kind of like? concepts to brainwash people into thinking oh, I'm a good person I'm going to heaven or I'm a bad person you know, I'm going to hell when did that all sort of come in and we don't go with that theory do we because it's not really well, any such thing in a general sense it's not quite like they they've been saying like if you have a relative die and they are in the casket and they're uh some preacher standing over him and saying, yes, your Uncle Jack is, is now in heaven. Well, he's not, you know, because his body is right there and, and it has to be planted. <laughs> and then at the resurrection, see, no one is ascended into the heavens except the one that descended. And, and King Daoud is mentioned in the book of Acts as not having ascended. So he's not there either. So. He has to be resurrected, you know. But Shamayim, or heaven, is 
actually all around us, but it, we can't see it because we're fallen. Mm -hmm. It's a higher dimension, if you want to call it that. Different but dimension. it's the reign of Yahuwah is what it really is. What we when we read the scriptures and it says that it's the uh, the reign of the heavens, it's talking about that's the reign that's coming. You know, the reign of the heavens, and uh, that's when Yahuwah takes the reign. He's reigning in heaven now, but he's not reigning on earth. Oh, well, he's in control. That's true, but the adversary is still in control of this earth, which is you know seen in the fact that we're, we're, we're messing this place up much worse than we could ever imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, not because of just selfishness, but we're um, being tempted on three levels mainly. Uh, the uh, lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, which are focused on possessions and uh, pleasure and position. You know, so, And you see that the governmental leaders are uh, the ones that rule over the nations are really uh, bent on having possessions, pleasure, and power. And they will kill their whole population to retain those things because that's just the way they do. And that's the wrong way. In other words, there's obviously demonic realms or principalities controlling the organization of this world. Mm -hmm. And it says in Daniel 4, that we are ruled over by the lowest of men. In other words, the basest of men. Maybe uh, the women are right. Maybe we ought to have women. But actually, what they, what they wouldn't matter. If you had all women ruling, then the demons would still control them, you know, mm -hmm. because they're not down, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. when we say things like binding and loosing, we're talking about uh, forbidding and permitting. Do we have that power, then? Aren't we to not talk to spirits? No, we're not supposed to talk to spirits. Only The only spirit we can talk to is, is Yahushua's spirit. And it's Yahushua. You can call on Yahushua in the name of Yahushua. But uh, if we have these commandments written on our hearts, and we study these commandments, and someone comes to us and says, is this permitted? <laughs> and we go, well, let me think. Oh, no, you can't kill that person because that would be against the sixth commandment. You do not. So you can't kill the guy because he's your competitor or, or, your, or some annoyance to you. Okay, you can't break wedlock, you know, and you can't steal. All these things we can loose and bind if necessary. If somebody says, well, is it stealing if it's already mine and someone else stole it from me and I steal it back? Well, <laughs> uh, that, see, these are all questions that can happen. Yeah. People try and talk like that, don't they? <laughs> There's a lot, so many yeah. gray areas, apparently. Yeah, but uh, you should go to the, you know, the elders and work that thing out. Or work, go to the person that's offended you first, of course, you know. And say, you know, I believe uh, you have some uh, property there. I had that problem once. I had somebody take a, an item, and it was expensive. And they said, well, I, I felt like uh, somebody else owed that to me, so I took it from you. And I uh, went, <laughs> well, that's mine. I'd like it back, please. So they brought it back to me. But I did go to them. I didn't go to the police first or you know, somebody else, I went to them. You know. yeah. I said, you know, that's mine, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, when they talk about hellfire, I mean, the, hell, the word hell and hellfire is all through the scripture. So if you say to somebody, oh, there's no such thing as hell, they'll go, look, it's here, it's written everywhere. It's hell, you know, that's where. Lake, lake of fire. Yeah, lake of fire. So what, what's the deal with that? Because, I mean, he's not going to punish people for eternity, is he? Don't we just get well, destroyed if you're not in it? There's generally two two schools of thought on that. And one is that Yahuwah is, is perfect, and of course we know that he is. And he, his perfection requires, you know, a person to be accountable. And if a person refuses the offered blood of the Messiah, and they're condemned into the lake of fire, 
they're thrown into the lake of fire with the, you know, Satan and the, the false prophet and the beast, which, uh, you know, are the first to go in, actually. You know, Satan doesn't go in until the very last, but the beast and the false prophet go in at the first resurrection. So there are people occupying the lake of fire. So, uh, but we don't know if they're occupying it consciously, you know. We just know that it's a, an everlasting smoke that goes up. That's everlasting as a sign that something bad happened at one time. Someone was destroyed. Now, there's the school of thought that they're punished eternally, and that um, there's different levels of punishment, but, uh, you know, the, the flames um, are mentioned in, in the uh, text where Yahushua is explaining about the death of Lazarus, and there's someone that's waiting in the bosom of Abraham on the wrong side, and he's talking about how thirsty he is. And of course, this is a, not mentioned as being a parable, but it's uh, at the same time possibly an illustration. But uh, there's things that we don't that we don't know. But uh, if he does punish them eternally, then he's sovereign to do so. I'm not, what, I'm not so much to say uh, that I'm going to emphatically deny one or the other. However, I will say that I lean toward the idea that the lake of fire is going to be a place of destruction. So the person who has a spiritual component to them will be resurrected, given their eternal life in their body. And then they will be both body and being or soul, thrown alive into the lake of fire and utterly destroyed. And that'll be a final thing. And the smoke of their burning will rise forever and ever. That's my leaning. However, I'm not going to presume to say that there's enough text. I've read books on hell before and uh, there's people that have written many books on that topic, and people that have gone there, or at least seen it, and they say that it was real, and now that, then they awakened and, and came back and wrote a book about it. You see, these are based these are based upon uh, conjecture and you know guessing and experiences that may or may not be reality. You know, but uh, you know that's uh, these are all parts of the strongholds that we can accept. That's why I don't like to get involved in fixing myself strongly on either one, because it's outside our sovereignty anyway. These are things that Yahushua himself uh, designs, plans, and executes. And whether we like it or whether we don't, we have to say, you are sovereign, and I'm going to go along with whatever it is. But at the same time, knowing his heart, He's probably not going to punish people and torment them like we would see somebody in the neighborhood possibly that lights a cat on fire and watches it die miserably. I don't think he's like that. I don't think that he's, he will destroy the, the, sin, the sinner because of the fact that they uh, were offered eternal life. And then if you're going to be suffering for eternity, then it would seem logical that you would have eternal life too. But it doesn't say they have eternal life. It says that it's a second death. Now, a death is a death, an end point. And a second death would be another second end point. So there's a body and there's a spirit. And when they're separated, the body dies. But the spirit, and people will say, oh no, he's not going into that Greek myth, is he? Well, <laughs> yeah. There's, a, there's an eternal... Uh, being that he created in each one of us. And when that dies, it's sleeping until it's awakened at the resurrection. And then it's either going to receive reward or it's going to receive punishment. And the punishment would be an end point, a second death. And that is what scripture says. Now, if it said, yes, absolutely, it's going to be going on forever and ever and ever, and they're going to be tortured and people are going to be in pain. Well, it would go into that, if we're to know this, you know. But, you know, it's it's really tough to call. Because, you know, we haven't been there. We haven't talked to anybody that's come back. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It's like going through a stargate. Mm. If you don't go through, you'll never know. Yeah. You know. So the amazing thing that that sort of come out the last couple of weeks is that if you're part of the bride, the chosen group, if you're part of the first resurrection, then you're you're fine. You you'll be shining. You're you're great. Um, but if you're not part of that resurrection, you will have to lose your own life for your own so for your own salvation. That that was that was a total blowout. It just makes you more want to want to give over, sell over, be possessed, be into His will, and just all these plans and projects and stuff that you think are important. Just sort of just let it all go and and yeah. see what His will is. Is that sort of your understanding of it too? I agree. Yeah, when you're possessed by His Spirit, then you have life. And that's what the uh, idea of the Shekinah is also, because the Shekinah is the, where the name is nested. And the name is nested in a certain group of people. And when you talk to one of them, you'll know. Even if they misspell it, according to one or the other. You know, there's people that say, no, you're not using the right spelling. Well, you know, if they love the name, they're, they're okay. You know, it's just that they we have a limited amount of knowledge that we that we can get muster on in, in, individually. But the idea, though, is that his name is in residence in the in the in the people, and uh, he's marked them with that seal. You know, the seal of his name. So, who are we to say? You know, and that's why they're going to be shining because it isn't their own light that's going to be shining. It's going to be the Shekinah, the Kabod. Of, of the presence of Yahuwah in them. And so when we're teaching people in the millennium, if we're counted worthy of the first, the higher calling, and the first resurrection is the higher calling, and his coming, then for a thousand years we will rule and reign with him and teach the fleshly people who are still, you know, in the flesh. And they'll be, you know, marrying and having children, and we'll be teaching them. And... Uh, will look like some kind of bright light to them. Mm. We'll be, you know, mm. we'll be like the messengers, like the angels. I think I, I think I said it wrong before. What I, what I wanted to say was the, the three and a half year tribulation, which we discussed last time, that's, that, that's the period where if you're not, how, how did you put it? You put it brilliantly. Like we, we get the name, those who get the name now and want, to be sealed and want to be part of the bride and are sold over are in now. Those who, you know, poo-poo it and, you know, don't want it, but are convinced during the tribulation because of all the plagues, those that come to Yahushua, well, that's great, but you'll probably have to lose your life. Yes, and that seems to be what's mentioned in Revelation. About did the, I say that right? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. Oh, good. You might... You might get the the, the the name, and you're persecuted for having the name, but you have to die because of the fact that you were coming out of the great tribulation. It talks about the the beings that are under the altar, whose um, basically it was their blood crying out to Yahuwah, saying, "How long until our blood is avenged?" And those are the ones that came out of the uh, out of the great tribulation, hmm. which uh, we understand will be, uh, you know, 300, oh, well, uh, 1260 days or three and a half years. Hmm. And that particular span of time is going to be very, very brutal. And it's going to be like no other period has ever been on the earth, according to Daniel and Yahushua. Hmm. Both of them refer to that. Daniel chapter 24. No, it's uh, Daniel. Uh, and and in uh, Matthew or Matthew chapter twenty four, yeah, mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah, those are the people. I think they're probably going to wind up, mm -hmm. you know, wishing that they had not waited. But some people are not going to be able to accept it because we're not working hard enough to reach them. But, uh, you know, we're not all together. We're all arguing with each other. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's got to stop. You know, we we have to stop them. We have to say, okay, let's get over ourselves 
look at the harvest out there. We've got a lot of work to do, you know. Mm -hmm. But now let's turn towards that and get these Ten Commandments out there, you know. Because the Ten Commandments teach His name, you know. Yeah. And they teach love for Him and love for the neighbor. And uh, and once the people get the, the idea, but the governments are fighting against this now. I don't know what it's like in Australia, but the government, the federal government, and state governments sometimes are prohibiting the the actual teaching of these commandments to these children, and then the society is just turning it inside out, and it's churning because we don't have these instilled in the hearts and minds of children, and therefore we have we're reaping the whirlwind, you know. Marriage is almost rare now, you know. Yeah. The divorce rate might go down because people are not getting married, you know. Because <laughs> yeah. why would you, you know, uh, if they're going to cohabitate together, they don't accept it as a marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, the government really has nothing to do with marriage anyway. Mm -hmm. Never have, never will. They might think they do, and that, that that they even that they can define a marriage, which is really. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of insane and foolish. But um, it's almost like the whole world's gone mad. Mm -hmm. I mean, people will be marrying horses next. You know, like, here I'm leaving my horse. Uh, this is my... <laughs> it's just insane. You know, but... Uh, anyway, what Yahuwah brings together, let no man separate. So it doesn't say what the government brings together, let no man separate. Because the government can't bring anything together. You know, anything they touch kind of falls to pieces or gets weird. You know, <laughs> they, if the government tries to fix something, then watch out. You know, <laughs> yeah. Stand back. Would you um, encourage people like believers around you and sort of say to them, if you saw the bickering and backbiting stuff, would you encourage them in the area of, you know, let's get our act together here. Because you know we may not make it, you know, like we, we we might have to lose our own life if we don't overcome. Like the whole key is to overcome, isn't it? What yes. Do or do you think the people that lose their lives in the three and a half years are purely just those who came in during that time? Do you think if well, you don't, yeah, if you don't overcome, then you could be just in that category? Because what you see if you don't overcome? Well, Yahuwah is sovereign all in all cases, so if we see the Great Tribulation begin, and some of us that had the name and the covenant before uh, wind up getting killed, then they're fine, you know. Uh, people are losing their, ch well, like uh, their children. You know, there was a, a brother that lost his, uh, well, Julie and Raymond lost their son Joel uh, just a week or a week and a half to two weeks ago. And uh, I didn't hear about it for over a week, but uh, the boy is fine, you know. And, you know, when you're taken out of the world, we see things differently than Yahuwah does. He doesn't see them as dead, you know. He's not the Elohim of the dead. He's the Elohim of the living. And um, when, we, when we're taken away from the world, then our work was done. And it sometimes manifested in order to show his sovereignty or to test us to see how we'll react to it but um, you know when we fix our eyes on him then everything's fine because it's when we start looking at the storm that's when we start sinking you know just like you know yeah. Peter you know we can't look at the storms of life and say that we're going to be able to walk on water. But we can walk on water. That's a metaphor. Um, Thank God, try that. <laughs> well, you actually can do it. Yeah. But he's given us so many examples that we need to watch the, keep our eyes fixed on him. That's a really good that's, lesson. Don't look at the storms of life. That's the lesson. Plenty and Raymond and Julie both need to remember that scene because. Um, you know, they are Peter in that particular situation, you know. Just keep your eyes on him. Don't look at the storm. 
because uh, it can carry you away, you know. But uh, when we're taken away, like if one of us dies and we mourn their loss, uh, they're actually in a better place, they're sleeping, they're safe, and they won't go through any more of the tribulation, mm -hmm. you know, the distress. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I, I feel like he's going to feed and clothe and care and protect for, uh, for all of those that, that are in his will, the ones that are staying with him, the wise virgins, the wise managers are going to have the protection you know, because, uh, you know, it's a matter of faith, you know, you know, that's, not just, but, but, you know. That's really helped what you said, because we were really shaken when we read that email too, because we thought, oh no, you know, these are fellow believers and they've lost their child, you know. 22 years old. Yeah. So we were really shaken. Yeah. You're feeding, clothing, nurturing, teaching, training, and he's just about where he's at. And he's got about to blossom, and then he's taken from you. Wow! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's no greater pain, probably possible, than to lose a child. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Yahuwah knows that feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, on the subject of. Um uh, say tithing and things like that uh, that's that's gone isn't it would you be somebody if you had I mean none of us seem to but if you had a, an abundance of like monetary wealth would you be the sort of person that would say okay well I'm still going to tithe put it somewhere for a rainy day if there were widows or orphans or things like that or would you tend to just be wise just generally save and, and manage things wisely do you think that the tithe is still relevant today or is it just something we shouldn't even bother saying? Well the tithe is something that was in force uh, as a in the, in the Melchizedek's priesthood. If we look at Adam, the first man, and we understand that he was more than likely the, the high priest and he was the of the order of Melchizedek although Melchizedek didn't exist and it passed down from Adam and so on into Seth and into the various people. And if you track it all the way to Melchizedek, and he's the priest of the Most High, Elion. And uh, when we uh, understand that Abram went to him and gave him a tithe of all of his increase, then that was more than just food. And I've got a lot to learn on that topic. But... Um, it wasn't necessarily food that he was giving to this man. And I have understood, though, in the, and not in the order of Melchizedek, but in the Levitical priesthood, there was, there was a uh, uh, prescription of the tithe to be given in food. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't money, but it was food. So if uh, we have to keep giving food to the priesthood, we're going to have to chase around and find one another because we're all the priests according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, it's, it's a tough to to topic to really address in a short brief time, but it was originally not just food. It was all the increase. So if he increased by, uh, let's say, a thousand dollars, then $100 would be given as a tithe to the priest, uh, the, the, the priest of Salem. The, uh, you know, if his name is Melchizedek, uh, that we understand that would be the, what the order is called. But the, uh, it's because of the priesthood that he was giving it to him. And Abram, Abraham was a very rich man. You know, but we don't read about him giving anything but that one time, you know, which is interesting. So uh, you'd have to ask yourself that, too. Uh, but the, the, when the temple stood, now that's a very important phrase. When the temple stood and when they were in the land, they had to obey certain laws, you know. Now, being in captivity with no temple, 
and no operating priesthood, it's literally impossible to do many of the things that people see listed in these so-called 613 Torah laws. And many of them are for females only, and many of them are for males only, and some of them are for the priest to do only. So everybody can't just do it, you know. So, so when you so earlier on in the show, when I was saying about which commandments do you obey and which ones do you not, those are two other main things that come into play too. When the temple was standing, and when they are in the land, there are certain regulations for those two things too. So, if you're not in the land, you'll notice that he's talking to the children of Israel from the Shekinah, and he's telling them, when you go into the land, this is what you're to do. You know, that's part of it too. But when you come out of the land, you know, because you disobeyed um, or you're sent into captivity, then these things come to a halt. So everything's on hold in a, in a sense. You know, not that the Sabbath isn't coming and going, it is. But the fact that they can't operate, the temple can't operate, and the priesthood's not there, and uh, the tithe can't happen because there's no way to pay to leave the Levitical priest, you know. But in the in the offerings that we give him now, it's from our lips, you know. And if we have, some of us have wealth that we can share to do the work. Um, I work to support this ministry. That's my main principle here. I mean, that's what I did. I, I work in order to pay the bills, but I fall way short, and I need somebody to come in and make up the difference. But if people give me a, a few dollars a month regularly, which if, if you do, then I'm able to come up to the waterline and pay the bills. Of course, if something breaks, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to need help too. But when we tell people we need help because of a specific thing, and they help us, then that's, you know, that's a love offering, you know. And it's for the work of Yahuwah. Um, everybody does what they can, you know, to, to do what they can offer. Their, their labor or, or their, uh, you know, their prayers, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of different things that are needed. But the work principally has to focus on these commandments, getting into the hearts of the lost, you know. And how can that be accomplished? You know, what's the, the best way to do it? I, I know that we have to overcome the strongholds to get them in because there's so many people that are in pulpits teaching people that they should not obey these commandments, you know. And why would that be, you know? Because they themselves have been taught that. And they, these, are, these are all strongholds. But the issues like tithing or uh, the eating of unclean food or um, all these things that we can get, uh, or whether hell is real and whether if it's eternal or not, these are all issues that, you know, we all have to wrestle with and work out. But uh, it, while we're doing those things, though, sometimes we're getting distracted. You know, we need to say, well, I, I think I can give some money here and there. Abraham didn't give money every uh, week, you know. He gave it one time. There's only one record of it. But he, uh, he obviously did it to help that man, you know. But he was giving it to Yahuwah, really. And it wasn't to give it to the man, because Yahuwah can't help the man. But Yahuwah used Abraham and anybody else that gives to someone else it's really giving it to Yahuwah as an offering, 10% of what they make. And uh, some people say it's more than that. It's three times that. But, you know, I give, all, I give it all. preaches. But I give all of your stuff. You know. Yeah. yeah. I hold anything back. I mean, everything is owned by Yahuwah. You know. Mm -hmm. But there's, uh, there's one thing that I thought was interesting is when, he, when they would pillage one of these pagan temples, and he said, don't let your eye deceive you. Get rid of the gold and silver that you see, because they're made into idols. He said, don't take this thing out. I think it's Deuteronomy 7, where he talks about it. Don't uh, covet this stuff. Just 
utterly loathe it. Don't bring whatever you see into your home and defile yourself. You know, one of the things we do today is we see people bringing uh, Christmas trees into their home because they don't know what they are. They don't know that they're actually pagan altars, idols that have meaning to every symbol on them. They don't know where they started or came from. So uh, they bring them into their home because they feel like that's it's time to do it. And it makes them feel so warm inside, you know, in their hearts because they were trained that way. You know, that's a serious, powerful stronghold. Because, and it's idolatry, you know. But uh, yeah. obeying the commandments, though, you're never going to be wrong. If a person did decide in their heart that they were going to give 10% of their income to a, a particular work, then that would not be a, a sin, you know. But if they're not moved in their heart to do that, but they're moved in their heart to do something else, you know, to pray diligently for the un unity of all the Nazarene and the lost and the unborn children that are being murdered, you know, pray for whatever you're given to pray for. Uh, that is also um, an act of righteousness, you know. But, um, but it's not the law... Of tithing, oh, or is it, that's more of a free will offering or giving, giving helping, helping. Yeah, a natural impulse for a person who has Yahusha in them is to lay their lives down for their brothers and sisters, and whatever it might take. Uh, it would be un, unlikely that a person would say, "Oh yeah, I see uh, my fa other family members are languishing; they're hungry." or they have no place to live, and to not open your heart to them, uh, that would be like worse than an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. So we do have to care for the, the hungry and the fatherless and the orphan, you know, and the, uh, and of, of course, the, those of our own household that are in need. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely still in force. It always will be. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as giving to priests, well, uh, we're all priests, you know, so yeah. <laughs> what are we going to do? Yeah. Get together and, you know, hey, here's $10. <laughs> here's $10. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> that's not what the point is, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, the tithe, if you read Malachi, it's, it's about food. You are withholding the tithe. And there needs to be food in my house. You know, he's talking about that. So that the hungry, the ones that are in need, that don't have anything to eat, can eat. Because, see, the Levites eat, and then they share this overwhelming abundance with them, those that are that are in need. You know, hopefully they won't stay in need. You know, but a lot of people in the turbulence of all societies, there's people that have a good time for a while, and then, they're, then they take a dive. Other people come in and help them. You know, that's what we're supposed to do, help one another. And uh, sometimes uh, a person will be in a bad situation. They'll be work their way back up to a nice situation. They don't have to keep getting money from the government. They can stop doing that, you know. Uh, or, get, you know, in, in some cases, I guess, when, one could look at taxation. A large part of our taxes are taken basically at gunpoint, uh, to give to those that are in need. And that's fine. You know, I wish that we uh, didn't have to do that. I wish we could go back to families more, you know, instead of relying on the government. But as the family unit has been de in decline, the government has had to step up and make up for these broken families, you know, and, the, and all the things that happen. You know, when marriage is not working, then uh, the government has to step in. You know, mm. so uh, and when the economy is in decline too, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, terrible things happening. Mm. Right here in our city, uh, and I know all, all across the country, there's a lot of people that are becoming violent over the downturn of the economy. You know, mm. I was talking to a man that came into that shop a few days ago. 
And he walked up to the counter and he said, uh, are you hiring? I said, oh, I do wish I was, but I'm not. But uh, he said, well, I just got out of prison. I was in there for several years. And I said, really? Oh, my. Here's a book. And I gave him Fossilized Customs. I said, this might help you. He said, uh, yeah, it's like I've been asleep for several years. And I just woke up. I said, well, this might make up for it. And you might be able to find out uh, what's going on, what's happened. And uh, Fossilized Customs might have something in there that will awaken his spirit, you know. Yeah. But yeah. he said he was in there for bank robbery. He was, he'd robbed a bank, you know, because he was so desperate, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's one of the commandments, see? Number eight, you do not steal. Yeah. yeah. You don't rob banks. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's just not, not, the, not the right thing to do. Um, but you can go to your family, and I think if, if we're of Yahusha, then we uh, open our hearts and our homes. And, um, whatever we have is, you know, I think you, Paul explained it, that, or Luke, you know, whatever is uh, needed, the fir they first need to go to their own families before they go to the assembly. So the assembly should be the last option. But they should go see if they've got family that can take care of them first. And if they don't, then they can come to the assembly of the saints. And there they can find their sustenance. You know, the food. And it was food, you know. They talked about it in the book of Acts. And uh, it was obviously in the book of Acts, I think Acts chapter 4, it talks about how that from time to time, someone who owned lands or houses would sell one and they would bring the proceeds to the apostles and lay it at their feet and it was then distributed that according to those that were in need mm -hmm. so it doesn't say they used it to build uh, steeples or convents or anything like that but uh, anybody that had need they went to the apostles and the leadership, and they received food. You know, they had tables. And the apostles themselves were actually waiting on tables. That's what we're reading about. And that in order for the, their time to be better used, rather than working, feeding, feeding the poor, they appointed for themselves others who would be, you know, inclined to do that because Yahushua being in them wanted they, the servant they were so they were really amazing servants you know if the apostles themselves were serving tables for the people who couldn't feed themselves that that's a real indication that they really understood what happened at the last supper you know when mm -hmm. Yahushua watched their feet <laughs> but uh, yeah it's all about service you know, and then serving one another, see, we're serving Yahushua. Because you're, we are his body. You know, mm -hmm. so we help one another. Yeah. yeah. So, tithing, um, yeah, it's, you know, Yahushua didn't say that there was no tithe. He, he, he did claim that there was a tithe. But then, and that was when the temple was standing. Mm -hmm. You know, but 40 years later, when the temple was destroyed, it's problematic to find a way to do that. But we will always be able to, you know, find orphans and fatherless and, uh, and, and, and widows and people that are in great, great need, you know. So we should help those that are in our midst. You know, family first and then the others. Speaking of the assembly, um, we don't seem to see too many um, believers getting together and singing songs and having spiritual gifts and, you know, praying in the spirit and speaking in tongues and all the things that happen in Acts and are addressed in Corinthians of how to, I mean, if it wasn't true, why would Paul address it and say there's rules to this? Um, what's the deal with that today? 
why is there, whenever you bring up tongues, that seems to be a very, well, that's what we came out of, that's Pentecostal, that's Christian, let's leave that behind. Um, what's the deal with that today? Do you think it's relevant or do you think they were just speaking languages to get the word out quickly and now we've got the internet? Well, you know, the Greek language at that in that t day and time was a polluted language. And uh, although it was the language of the era and a lot of the countryside or nations around Israel, I think, believe, I believe that Israel was, uh, you know, the land of Israel at that time was speaking Aramaic or certainly Hebrew. Uh, and Aramaic is a derivative of Hebrew. But uh, when they were speaking to one another, but then again, some of the people, like Paul, knew several languages, one probably being Greek and Latin. And his, uh, the reason that the medium of Greek was used at all was because it was just the language of the world. It was the language of commerce. Now, today, English is the language of commerce all over the world. That's what Yahushua is doing. He's speaking to this people in a babbling, jabbering lip. That's what he said. He was going to speak to this people in a jabbering lip and <laughs> with a foreign tongue and mm -hmm. teach them his covenant again over and over. And, and this is the last day's prophecy, you know. So uh, anyway, that's the, the groundwork of this whole thing, I think, is that we're aware of that we're speaking the language that we're supposed to be speaking, which it is jabbering. But in that time, when they were speaking in the synagogues or the gatherings, in the congregations is a better idea, when they were con congregated together and there was a person who had a tongue, in other words, a, a, something to say, and they said it out loud, and then there was someone there to interpret it for those who were in attendance, now that was a back channel kind of way of doing it, but the person that was having the tongue was speaking to people in a comprehensible language that Yahushua was speaking to. Like when we read the Ten Commandments in English, we're jabbering in another language other than Hebrew. We're not using the set-apart tongue. But when we say it in such a way that other people can understand it, then that's because they speak English also. But if there's people in the group from other places, which is definitely the case when they were recording Acts chapter 2 because they were from Parthia and uh, Greece and the islands and all these places, well, po possibly dozens of languages of different people were there and they were all congregated together. Now, uh, that same thing happened in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8. When they when the people came back to rebuild the walls of the city and the temple and houses for themselves to live in and so forth, Nehemiah and Ezra the prophet assembled all the people in the seventh month and they all listened to the words of Yahuwah, the Torah, the instructions, and it, and it was explained to them and translated so that they would understand it. So there were people that spoke different languages, and obviously the fact that many of them had come from Babylon and grown up in Babylon, they weren't familiar with the Hebrew. So it had to be written, or it had to be read aloud in their hearing. And then it says, it's very carefully explained that, that, that it was made apparent for their understanding, you know, so they had to translate. That's what they were saying. That's what that was. But uh, the same thing happened in the book of Acts. So that this was necessary. Uh, now, when people get together and they all speak English, and then one of them starts talking in a language that no one knows in the room, that's strange. <laughs> what would be the purpose of that? When we use Hebrew words, however, we are speaking in tongues. We're speaking the set-apart tongue. And we also take and explain that to them. You know, when we use a Hebrew word, we're very careful for people and sensitive for those people that don't understand. So we very carefully stop and say, wait, a minute. these are the words. Like when I say we have a seminar, we have a, an explanation of the words at the beginning. 
a person that might get it on DVD can back it up and look at it and study it. Mm. Mm. Well, that's brilliant, yeah. So it's not some cosmic spiritual thing, it's really just practical. If someone doesn't understand what you're saying, explain it to them. Yeah, and Paul explained it in such a way that if a person is just talking, beating the air with his tongue, and he's saying, well, you know, what use is that? How can you, how can you play a discerning song if you don't uh, play the notes right in an organized way? You know, he used musical instruments as an example. You know, you have to be, have an order to everything that you do. And he was very uh, uh, inclined to explain that they need to be doing things in an orderly way. But the disorder of the mind, when we're hearing things that no one knows what it means, you know, that's kind of bizarre. Mm -hmm. And now that whole thing is turned on its head now that uh, charismatic uh, movement is really infiltrated with the uh, kundalini spirit and all that stuff, you know, where people are actually shaking and making animal noises and writhing on the floor and falling over, snaking, snaking, snaking and <laughs> flame in the spirit, you know, uh, picking up snakes. Well, there's a lot of things that are just mm -hmm. weird things to do, but they're all for signs. See, the handling of snakes or the speaking in tongues that a lot of people are doing, that's hypocrisy because they're doing it for show. And they're doing it with the purpose probably of getting, and healing too. To a lot of extent. Now, you know, yeah, I'm not saying that Yahuwah can't heal. I'm just saying that in some cases, these things are not of Yahuwah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying a blank, I'm not making a blanket statement here. I'm just saying, you know, if if the evidence of the spirit is there, then it is Yahusha, you know. But uh, you don't want to necessarily just start willy-nilly just making up stuff and and then uh, saying, well, it's not really Yahuwah, it's a demon. But, you know, you have to be uh, aware of the fact that it could be just the person's motivation to, to take in a lot of money or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Because the person's in a wheelchair and they stand up and start dancing, you know. <laughs> but snake handling, you know, yeah. wait a yeah. minute. You know. mm -hmm. It's for show. Yeah. See, yeah. it's signs and wonders, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They got to focus on this, you know. Yeah. If you're not talking these words, it's because there's no light of dawn in you, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the Torah and to the testimony, uh, we need to focus on that because yeah. people don't hear. If you got out of a big healing meeting at one of these places and you say, "Well, you know, you heard a lot of things. You heard some people talking, some people over there making bird noises, people down here uh, screaming and." going, whoa, and uh, acting drunk. Well, if you come out of the thing and you don't know the Ten Commandments and you can't even think of one of them, then what was the point of even coming together? Everything that we do is for edification. Whenever we come together, everything that's done is for edification. And everything is done in love. That's the purpose, the goal. If you've got a race and you don't know where the... Uh, where the path the race is going to be on is, and you don't know where the end point is, then you're not going to win. You're not going to finish. You have to know the path, and you have to know the end point. The finish line that we're pursuing is love. That's the goal. It says it in Scripture. The goal is loving you and loving your neighbor. And Yahushua said, in answer to the question, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, Love you with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. See, he, he, he gave you the goal. And the path to the goal is the, is the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. You know, So when you have meetings and you don't edify the congregation by teaching them those Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. then you've mm -hmm. really slipped up. You know, that's your statement of faith right there. You know, I don't know who could deny it, <laughs> yeah. except yeah. for all Christian yeah. pastors. Yeah, yeah, they don't teach these. Yeah. You know. Yeah.
there's two other main topics on your statement of uh, belief page. One of them is the Trinity, and the other one is the um, is the the idea of racism that, that there's a certain race that's chosen. Um, firstly, with the Trinity, it's pretty simple to say we don't believe in the Trinity, do we? That's a pagan concept. Yeah, it's another stronghold. Scripture doesn't actually say. Let me explain how Yahuwah is three. Never mentions it. We bring that into the reading from outside, you know. And it actually became part of the doctrines in the early part of the apostasy, when the circus fathers uh, were instituting the rites of baptism. That was basically where that all started. And then there, there were three, but. Uh, you know, some held to two because they were constantly, even during the days of Constantine, they tried to discern between the father and the son, father and the son, you know, and they were really getting uh, confused about that. So they laid down the law about it, you know. They were having to fight the, what they called the heresy, you know, that was going on at that time. But, uh, it's uh, it's a stronghold, you know, when you can uh, accept that Yahuwah has reconciled the world to himself through his son, and that all esteem and thanks and honor is going to be given to Elohim the Father for what Yahushua did, then it's pretty easy to figure out that Yahuwah was in Yahushua doing that. And it says, it says that. That he is the manifestation of the invisible Elohim. So uh, do the math. You know, mm -hmm. it's not two beings. Yeah. He never mm -hmm. says there's two beings. It just, it's just confusing to people because the the body that was Yahusha is praying to the Father, and that confuses people because we're not like him. Mm -hmm. He's so mm -hmm. far above us. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. But he was giving a lot of these things to, as examples so that we would hear them. But uh, it's really confusing for people. But, you know, when you simplify it and do all the mathematical computations and analyze it, if he says, I am one, then he means it. He doesn't mean he's a family. That's one of the things that people do. They go, well, the word family is singular. So if there's two or three in a family then there's just one family, so that explains it. Well, <laughs> I don't know. So when we so when we go to the new Jerusalem, or when it comes to us, I should say, we um, we're not going to see Yahuwah on the throne and Yahusha sitting at his right hand, are we? It's just going to be Yahusha. Yahusha is is the right hand. Yeah, he's yeah. the strong arm. He, there's a lot of different terms for him. He's the manifestation of the Shekinah. That's Yahushua. But uh, it's really Yahuwah. You know, the messenger of Yahuwah is, is also Yahuwah. You know. And who is the messenger of Yahuwah? Yahushua. You know. <laughs> but uh, well, that's great. Well, that's great. you were talking about the Trinity. Okay. And there was another topic that you mentioned. Yeah, the, uh, there's a few different topics on the, uh, towards the end there, but it all it all basically is under the topic of racism. And if every few weeks you you send through a question someone's got about or something abusive, <laughs> you're not black, you're not one of us, or you're not white, you're not one of us. You're not white, you're not black, you're not whatever. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, all of humanity was formed from Adam and Kua, and uh, one blood proceeded all the way to the year 1656 of the world. And when the flood happened, there was one family that came through all the waters. Everything that had the breath of life in it stopped. There wasn't any of people sneaking around anywhere else. Yeah. It was a global flood. Everything that had the breath of life in it perished, mm -hmm. except what was on that ark. And that included animals, you know, because that's why the animals were on the ark. You know, they would have all died. There would have been no line. Uh, male and female. There wasn't uh, 
male and male, <laughs> you know. And so uh, the examples that we have laid down there show us that all the races that we have in all the nations of the world are made up of the descendants of Noah and his family, you know, and his three sons and their wives. So it's very clear that what we see as superficial skin colors and different things, that's nothing. They're created by Yahuwah. Everybody is. So we can't look at them and say, oh, well, you're not uh, worthy because, you know, you're... That's what Darwin was saying. Charles Darwin was saying that. <clears throat> he looked at uh, the Australian Aborigines and he looked at Negroes and said, yep, uh, there's no way they're going to be able to be uh, included because he was basically equating them with apes. And that is so wrong, you know. Um, because everybody's made in the image of Yahuwah. And if anybody, now this is going to really upset a lot of white people, but the truth of the matter is, when he formed the first man <coughs> from the dust of the earth, the soil was very rich. Now, if you look at rich soil, <laughs> that's not white, is it? Uh-oh. Well, the white people have lost melanin. We've lost information. See, DNA is made up of information. And the information is the DNA. And when we reproduce, we can't get more information. You know, that's what evolution teaches, but that's not real. You can only lose information every time a copy is made. And over time, and because of the fact that mankind was separated uh, during the days of Peleg, there was a separation, which was either caused by movement or the raising of the waters, which caused division of the land. The lands were divided. And this separated populations. And the populations were continuing to reproduce. He blessed them, and what he blesses reproduces. So uh, information started to lose, and uh, you know, as the loss of information happened, there was a uh, homogenization going on. You know, like look at all the Oriental people. When they have a child, they're they're not standing around going, "I wonder what color the hair is going to be." Oh, what color do you think the the eyes will be? Well, they're going to have dark eyes, and they're going to have dark hair, unless they're an albino. Uh, it's because of the fact that their population group has been isolated. And you, another thing we have to separate from all that, that's DNA, is uh, the culture, you know, which is made up of the language and the social behaviors. They have nothing to do with DNA. What if uh, everything that we do in one country that seems bizarre uh, and we just switched the people themselves but they were somehow able to take on the behavior. Not, I'm talking about the, the not their DNA but uh, it, it, some things would just be out of kilter it would seem to us but sometimes we can't put separate what we see on their skin from what they're doing. But what they're doing and saying and the language they speak and their customs have nothing to do with their their body. Mm -hmm. See? But they're all made, everybody on the planet is made in the image of Yahuwah. But uh, mm -hmm. originally, I think everybody was black. Mm -hmm. And after that, people would, they're, they're, they changed their, uh, they lost information. It's just like breeds. You see the word race and the word breed means it's the very same thing. If you take a, a, a wolf and you breed the wolf with uh, another wolf and the wolf gives, gives birth to babies and one of them's small and you keep, you know, keep changing the, uh, breeding the things out, you're breeding out certain traits is what you're doing. You're not breeding in traits, you're just separating out. You can take the smaller ones or the shorter haired ones, or the lighter furred ones, and keep breeding them together until they get to where they're a different kind of an animal. A different, it's still a dog-like creature, but uh, eventually you wind up with chihuahuas. <laughs> and they're 
really bizarre. And they're a breed because they were intentionally bred, because information was bred out of them. And the same thing happened to people. You know, not intentionally, though, although people would like to do that. They want to control the breed and improve the breed. You know? But uh, that was what Darwin was talking about, you know. Wasn't Hitler doing that? They're trying to do that today, too, aren't they? Breed the perfect yeah, human being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's called the science of eugenics, you know. And the biggest, the world's biggest eugenics organization that I know of is Planned Parenthood. I mean, the name Planned Parenthood. Parenthood. Well, <laughs> that's eugenics, you know. Uh, they also abort the most babies on the planet, too. They, they fund and teach other nations. It's a global eugenics organization. So, um, do you think, uh, do you think uh, particularly for Natrium, it should be more reliant on uh, a prayer based, like Torah based, like. It says in scripture, you who are closes the womb and opens the womb. And, you know, like after the lessons we did in that last year, we don't want to tamper with any of those systems now. We just go with the flow. Um, do you think that's the best way to do it? Rather, because otherwise you're trying to strain and, and make something happen. And it, there could be a bad outcome in that. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. It was a bad outcome when, when uh, Abraham uh, and Sarah were trying to help Yahuwah when they took Hagar and that was uh, that's produced some pretty long-term results you know but of course uh, you know we're, we're trying to you know stay in Yahuwah, Yahuwah's will you know and uh, one man and one woman you know that's a, that's a marriage and it, and it isn't the government that brings them together. It's no. Yahuwah Yuhu, brings them together. And uh, if they want to have a ceremony, uh, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Have a party. Celebrate with the close family and friends. And uh, mm -hmm. don't, don't sweat it too much. You know? If you act like you're married, then you are married. Mm -hmm. you know? But, uh, you know, but... Going back to the racial thing, uh, you know, there's no way that, uh, you know, there was, I mean, well, people are going to have different opinions, and you, those are strongholds, you know. The, the global flood is another spin-off problem, you know, from that same thing, you know. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were three sons. Through those three men, some say the three races are derived. You know, you've got Negroids, Caucasoids, and Mongols. Mongoloids, yeah. So those are basically skin and um, facial shape manifestations, but they're superficial because everybody comes from one blood, you know. Any other topics on that page, though? No? Uh, oh, I don't think there was. I think it was. Uh Yeah, regarding peoples of different races, African, Indian, and Asian peoples, how do you believe they fit into you as planned? Can they truly be saved? Yeah. Can they claim all the same promises as white Anglo-Saxons? Yeah. <laughs> what about intermarrying of people of different races? And you said, I know there are a lot who teach against this, but uh, Moshe was criticized for being married to a black girl. But this was shown to be wrong to criticize. The circumstance would also indicate that Moshe was not black. When we rank ourselves or judge the worthiness of others based on any external trait, we judge their maker. That was an interesting thing that Chris told me a few weeks ago that he'd said you'd said, but I hadn't picked up on it. He said, if you judge what's going on inside another believer, you're judging Yusha and you're just going to feel dreadful. Um, oh my! Yes. You can't do that. You just got to understand that everybody's in a process, and uh, he's he planted these little trees in the back of his yard because they didn't have a fence. And he planted these trees about this high, and he just watered them for years. And now they're big enough to give them privacy in the backyard. But they all grew at different levels. They all grew at different, and so he used the analogy that when the seed is sown, you just got to 
look after it, pull the weeds out, you know, water it. But the ones that look like they're really not growing very quickly, at the end, they're all going to be the same height. Um, so he uses that analogy a lot, and it's so true. You can't judge what other people... Everybody's in a different process. So that was amazing to me. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I wanted to... You mentioned before about uh, how Miriam had married a Kushite woman. And... Um, I mean, Moshe. Moshe married a Kushite woman. Miriam was critical of that. Aaron was too, but Miriam was really upset about the race difference. And this racial attitude in her heart so offended Yahuwah that he struck her with leprosy. And you, people can read about that in Numbers chapter 12, first 10 verses. Numbers chapter 12. Yeah, and uh, the descendants of Cush were uh, and, and are black, you know. So uh, intermarrying inter with other races is fine, you know. Now, it could be that Moshe was also very, very dark. We don't know. But uh, apparently they didn't look too much different from the Egyptians at the time because Moshe was embraced by the Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, of course, we don't, that's a, I'm just a, an assumption. It could be that Moshe, I mean, could have been, you know, a completely different colored skin than her. You know, she could have been black. The Egyptian could have been black, you know. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we weren't there, you know, because there were Nubian dynasties, you know. Nubian dynasties were the, were the black dynasties, you know. Because after all, what, what continent are we on there, you know? We're on the African continent, you know, so it's highly likely that a lot of the uh, Egyptians were uh, Kushite, uh, Ethiopian type people, you know, uh, more than likely, and mixed in, you know. But there was no uh, laws in the Torah about marrying other races. It was a, a matter of marrying people from other faiths, you know that would not follow the Torah. Because the mixed multitude of people came out, other captive peoples of other nations that the Egyptians had enslaved were coming out with the children of Israel. And they all came together as one. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when they went to the land, uh, near, near the land in, in Jericho, or Jericho, there was uh, Rahab, you know, who married Salmon. And the lineage of the Messiah is also mixed races. You have Moabites. Uh, you've got the, probably a Hittite. If Uriah the Hittite's wife was a Hittite, uh, because you know. Oh, it's uh, awesome. yeah. You have the lineage of Yahushua himself, Yahushua himself. Ruth the Moabitess. Rahab and Yebusite, and you've got Uriah's wife, who was, uh, you know, King Daud or David had sex with Bathsheba, and uh, oh, and there was also Sol Solomon himself. Remember the Queen of Sheba, mm -hmm. Ethiopia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, there's not any, any basis for being a racist in the scriptures. If any, uh, most of the time, I think people are not, uh, I think they're afraid of, they're, the fear of, uh, the fear of foreigners. What's the term for that? Uh, Aliens or something? Well, uh, the fear of foreigners is actually, uh, the reason for people to be afraid of differences. And that diff the differences make people afraid. And uh, it's not so much the way they look, but it's mostly the way they act. You know, mm -hmm. it's their culture. And like I was saying, there's a distinction between the physical DNA aspects of the person and their way they act is a cultural thing. You know? Like the way they, the language they speak, it has nothing to do with their DNA. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, look, it's... Uh, 
it's an Oriental person, they're going to start speaking Chinese here in a minute. Watch out. No, they're not. You know, you learn from the environment that you're in. You know, but uh, it's not ingrained in you. You know, but the Torah should be. You know, and that's what's so frightening is what I see happening in this country during my lifetime. I saw a nation that was really strong, and since they've thrown Yehuda out of the classrooms and out of the school systems, the young people are growing up with no morals. They have no morality at all. It's really amazing. Yeah, we were talking about them the other day as well. We were saying that um, it's like they've been taken over. They're just asleep. They're, they're just partying, spending their money, uh, just just living this existence cycle. And it's like they're not even there. It's like they've been taken over. Well, the end result of that is Yahuwah will allow the land to vomit them out. And I see this country that's happening. The storms, the droughts, the fires, and soon probably more earthquakes. Earthquakes are starting to happen too. But, uh, yeah, and the nation, can, the government cannot sustain the need that's going to follow them. So it might be time for some people to be thinking about uh, if they're going to be righteous, to think about maybe, you know, I hate to give up on this country, though, but it's really pretty far along, you know. To, it's, it's receiving its cur the curses now. You know, and, and the leadership at this particular moment happens to be uh, committed to be against Israel and has embraced the enemies of Israel. So when you make... Israel, your enemy, then you're automatically making Yahuwah your enemy. Would you agree? Yeah. They don't seem to care, you know, because they're worldly, you know. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's yeah. nothing but pressure around us all the time. Yeah, and it's sad because the rest of the world is kind of tied to this country that, that I live in. And uh, in many, many ways. But uh, we're giving billions of dollars to the enemy. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but I do pray for the Arabs, you know, the people themselves. Because they're, they're lost. They're in a stronghold. Mm. A, serious, a serious stronghold. So we need to pray for them. Well, I think we've laid out a fairly good uh, basis of basic belief from Torah there. I mean, we've, we've dealt in the first fruit series, we've, uh, we came in with the name of Yahuwah, the name of Yahusha, how to say and explain that right, interpret that properly. Uh, then we had uh, repentance, immersion. Uh, so people have, have got in the doorway, dealt with the first uh, and second resurrection, we dealt with the two resurrections and uh, then we did a lot of end time stuff. So this is really sort of ties it up. This is a, a, a lot of little topics that people will often go, oh, do we believe that or not? Yeah. If they haven't done well, that and that's a lot of fuel for people to be upset with us about too. But, you know, <laughs> that word that I was talking about for the fear of foreigners was xenophobia. Mm -hmm. My brain doesn't work very well sometimes. But, uh, yeah, when you're afraid of other people who are different, you know, whether they're just, uh, they can even look the same, but they're xenophobic because they don't understand their cultural differences. You know. mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll leave it at, at that, and then uh, is there something you wanted to plan next time, or is this finishing it off? Uh, well, well, yeah, we'll take a few weeks off. Yeah, we'll, we'll get this together. Uh, I'm putting all the rest of the... Um, last day discs together so that's uh, starting to come together and uh, um, remember people it's not written not with ink but it's our obedience mm -hmm. yeah. okay yeah. all right well you take care and I'll see you uh, have a wonderful day yeah it's been wonderful yeah. chatting with you again mate yeah yeah, yeah. great to see you yeah. well say hello to the family for me will do thanks we'll for everything you're doing brother Oh, and thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll see you next time, then. Love you, mate. Love you.
Love you. Bye bye. screen yod hey ua hey this transliterates in english to yahua there are many other interpretations the stragglers are fussing about there are many other interpretations that the stragglers are fussing about fussing all about it but to this date the best transliteration and the best interpretation for those who don't want to get caught up in an argument and get on with it. Just get on with it. The best name is Yahuwah. Yahuwah. That's how we say our Creator's name in English. That's the sounds that come off our tongue. Yahuwah. So that we can just stop arguing and get on with it. Thank you. Bye-bye.